five, four, three, two, one. But who's counting, right? And his name is Major. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Garrett. From the nation's capital. Major, fantastic. It's the takeout. This is a major achievement. With CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent. Major Garrett. Yes, CBS. Yes, hi. Major Garrett. Major, that's nonsense. And you should know better. Is Major out of the doghouse? <laughs> the answer is yes. Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. Thanks for hanging out at the takeout. For those watching on Paramount Plus CBS News streaming, we're in a different place, a very different place. We are in the House Judiciary Committee Library. So for those of you watching, we talk to the incoming and current chairman of the Judiciary Committee on the House side, Jim Jordan. This looks like a deposition. <laughs> it is not. Mr. Chairman, it's good to see you. Good to be with you, Major. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, we are recording this, ladies and gentlemen, on January 12th. So by the time some of you hear this, other events may have happened. But remember, January 12th. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want your thoughts initially, uh, personally, and then what you will do, uh, if anything, as committee chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, about revelations this week yeah. with President Biden when he was vice president and documents marked classified found where they should not have been. Yeah, the, our, our angle in the Judiciary Committee would, would be um, how the Justice Department handled this. And we know one key fact already that they knew, at least, at least about the first batch, uh, they knew about these classified documents at the Penn Biden Center here in town uh, back before the election on November 2nd. So what has transpired between November 2nd and now? Uh, we know there's been a U.S. attorney, Mr. Laos, you know, who's, who's looking into this. In fact, when the, when the story broke, and congratulations to CBS for breaking the story, um, when the story broke, it looked like it was all kind of the, the, the White House had had this all wrapped up in a, in a bow with a ribbon on top because, you know, you had the U.S. attorney. We looked into it, and they turned it over right away, and the archives got it and all this. But I do think it's a fundamental question um, what's all happened in the two months' time since you learned, and why didn't the country get the chance to know about this prior to the midterm election? Do you think this, it would have made any difference? You never know, but I do know the, the, the press and everyone and the Justice Department sure made a big deal out of what happened 91 days before the election when there was the raid on President Trump's home. So I think right now um, there are tons of questions. A lot of those I think will be answered in the Intel Committee and in the Oversight Committee, but we'll be looking at the Justice Department component. Understood. Uh there's been a disclosure of a, another batch in another location. Yeah. Does that trouble you? Well, I, again, I think there's tons of questions. You know, where's the raid? Where's the pictures we saw when, when they went to Trump? When they went to Mar-a-Lago, they put pictures in folders and classified and compartmentalized. They had the, the, the pictures. Um, you know, where's the special counsel? Some have called for that. Uh, where's, what is a batch? No, it's more than one mm -hmm. document. Is it two? Is it 2,000? How many more batches are coming? Uh, where is the second location? Does it matter what? to you that these are relevant to his term as vice president as opposed to president? Well, I, I would think that would only add to the weight of it. Because? Because? Well, because the Supreme Court's been clear, the president is the person who has the ultimate ability to declassify um, documents. The, the vice president can handle classified material, obviously, because of an executive order, so he had them. But I do think, you know, six years, was were, were these documents at the Penn Center now for six years or most of that six-year time frame? So, again, there are tons of questions, but the White House doesn't seem to have many answers right now. You mentioned the word raids. I well recall when the search warrant was executed at Mar-a-Lago, perhaps you, but certainly other Republicans said there shouldn't have been a raid in the first place. Are you in favor of raids in matters like this, or are you in favor I didn't say of that. not raids? I didn't say that. I just said there's, there's an obvious, it seems to me— uh, What's that, your bottom line on that? Should there be raids, or can this be handled differently? And what, should it be handled? I think I think what I'm saying is the double standard, I think, is starting to become evident. We've seen the double standard time and time again. We saw how Hillary Clinton's, when she had classified material, how that was handled versus how it was handled with President Trump. My understanding, from what I know, is is, is uh, President Trump was working with the Justice He let the Justice Department come down and go through Mar-a-Lago. He said they said lock stuff up in this certain room, put a padlock on it. He did that. So he was he was working with them. Um, I just see the double standard as the concern, I think, what so many think people have. What do you think the standard have. should be? Classified documents are serious matters. They should be handled appropriately. But what should the standard be? Not, I understand what you're, the point you're making yeah. about a double standard. What should the standard be? How should this be approached from the Judicial just, just Department's point of view? I don't think they know. I mean, what do you think? Do you have an opinion on I that? I think it should be consistent. So you, the, the, you tell me. So, so look, you got classified material. Um, it, let's, let's, let's treat it con, in a consistent fashion. That's, that's what I'm saying. And, and 
Th this is part of this overall concern so many Americans have. I've, I've heard it from constituents all the time. They're sick of the double standard that they see out there. Um, uh, the, the, on, with, with how how conservatives get, to, you, you can pick your example. Look at look. We just had this debate on the floor yesterday. Uh, the Face Act, which says that there that there you can't restrict someone's access to an abortion clinic. The Justice Department has said it's on their website that applies to crisis pregnancy centers as well. But we sure see a double standard here because there have been over a hundred crisis pregnancy centers and churches attacked in the aftermath of the leak of the Dobbs opinion. And I, to my knowledge, no one's been prosecuted. But yet you had the gentleman outside of Philadelphia, Mr. Halk, Mark Halk, whose door was kicked in, who was arrested in front of his wife and seven kids for praying in front of an abortion clinic. That sure seems like a double standard. So what we want is consistency, equal application of the law. And it's frankly why the Republicans have set up this committee to look at Which we will get how, to. How, how there is, has not been equal application of the law from our Justice Department. Do you believe a special counsel should be appointed in the matter dealing with President Biden, then Vice President Biden's documents? All I know is there's one for President Trump, and, and now we have a similar situation happening with President Biden. So if you're going to be consistent, it looks like there should be. I don't know uh, for sure, but that, that to me is, again, part of this double standard we see. Some have called for it, and if that's what's warranted, I'm fine with that. Do you have any reason to doubt the um, competency or believability of John Lausch, who is the U.S. attorney in Chicago, a Trump holdover who was first referred the matter to? I don't know that much about Mr. Lausch. I do know he, he back in 2018, there was something relative to the Mueller, but I have to go back and look. But I, it was, it's funny you bring that up because yesterday uh, I was talking with some of our staff and I said, I know that name. And I know there was a task given to him by, um, by uh, then Attorney General Sessions uh, and I, but I forget exactly, but it was something to do with the whole, I think the whole Trump uh, Russia Mueller uh, probe that was that was getting launched. That makes you somewhat doubtful. If I I can't remember the details, but I just remember that that assignment and uh, and not much happened with what he was what he was looking into. And I can get that for you, but I just I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. You mentioned now. a moment ago that when this story was first revealed by CBS News, it looked as if the White House had it wrapped up in a tiny bow. When it doesn't, what does that tell you or what kind of things does that make you wonder about? What's next? You know, is there going to be a third batch? Uh, wh wh where is this location? I mean, the questions we, we said just a few minutes ago. I mean, I think all those questions jump in. There, there's, there's always the, you know, the where questions, you know, wh wh where's, where's, the, where's the raid? Where's the, where's the location? Where, wh what's the next batch? Why did you wait? Why, why was it lawyers? The, the, in the first story that you guys broke, um, it talked about they were moving offices and lawyers discovered, and it, it, kind of the first thing I take away is, well, normally when I'm just a country boy, when we move things, it's, you know, you call up your family, you buy pizza for them, and you get the truck and you move things. It's not lawyers who are moving things. So they were obviously there looking for something. My hunch is maybe they know Mr. Comer and the oversight committee is going to be looking into the Biden business, the family business operations. Maybe they were there getting ahead of the getting ahead of the curve. I don't know that, but that could be a reason you have lawyers involved with with the moving process. Do you think criminality might be involved? We'll have to wait and see. That's I mean, Mr. Mr. Comer is 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 adamant about getting to um, James uh, Comer, who is the incoming chairman of the oversight. Committee. The oversight committee has uh, Jamie's talked about. Um, he wants to get access to the suspicious activity reports. It's our understanding that there are over 150 of these. These are. He's talked about that on this very program. Yeah, yeah. Go back to the archives, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, if you're curious. Um, some of your fellow Republican colleagues have suggested that already President Biden has committed impeachable offenses. Do you agree or disagree? That's a question. I mean, the whole impeachment court, that's a question for the entire Republican conference. It's a question that Do Speaker, you have an Speaker McCarthy, I think, I think Joe Biden's been a terrible president. You can, you can look at any measurement. We have a border that's no longer a border. We have a military that can't meet its recruiting goals. We have bad energy policy, bad education policy, record spending, record inflation, record debt. And Historically, gotta, that in itself has not been grounds gotta, for impeachment. I'm not saying it is. I'm okay. just saying that, that that's why I said that that'll be a decision for the conference. And, and, and we have a government that I think has actually been in many ways weaponized against the American people. That's why we formed this, this, this committee. Um, so that's, that's his two years in office. And for goodness sake, we got two more of this. But uh, any question about that is, is a question for the entire conference. That is the voice of Jim Jordan, 4th District of Ohio. He is the incoming and current chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. We are recording this in the House Judiciary Committee Library, a place I've never been before. I'm somewhat well-traveled in Washington, so <laughs> this is a bit of an adventure for me. I'm Major Garrett, segment two of The Takeout, in just one second.
and 25 parents were investigated. If that's not targeting the, the, the citizens who pay your I mean, I, I, if that's not the weaponization of government, I don't know what is. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. It looks like a deposition. It is not. <laughs> I'm Major Garrett. Jim Jordan, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, is our special guest. Mr. Chairman, yeah. you referenced it a couple of times. I want to ask you about this select committee of the yeah. Judiciary Committee on the weaponization of government. Specifically, who are the victims of this and what, who, who, are, who is likely to testify before the select committee? Well, let me, let me give it a little context first. Uh, you had the Department of Justice target parents, use the Patriot Act against moms and dads, who are simply showing up at school board meetings. You've had an FBI— Rhetorically or specifically? Specifically. We, know, we had whistleblowers come talk to us. We know 25 parents were, were actually— The FBI showed up at their house because of the very apparatus that the Justice Will Department Will they be called up. as witnesses? We're looking at that. Uh, we think there are a couple people who would be, who would be good witnesses. Who, you know, I always—, I always um, the old line in politics is you know, no high-paid lobbyist will ever beat a mom on a mission when it comes to advocating for something important. And so these, these, these moms are advocating for their son or daughter at a school board meeting, and the FBI shows up <clears throat> at their home to talk to them because of the apparatus that Merrick Garland put in place at the urging of a left-wing political group, the National School Board Association, who then apologized for the letter that was, that was the pretext for putting together the snitch line, the dedicated line of threat communication is the language he uses in the memo. And 16 days after he puts that memo and sends it all, out to all U.S. attorneys, the FBI sends out an email saying, put this tag, this designation, this threat tag label on parents who were reported on the snitch line. And 25 parents were investigated. If that's not targeting the, the, the citizens who pay your – I mean, I, I, if that's not the weaponization of government, I don't know what is. Then you add to it the fact that the FBI was paying Twitter $3.4 million to censor conservatives. Whom? Well, we, we learned this from the Twitter files, but we know that this, this whole uh, uh, Elvis Chan at the, at the uh, uh, San Francisco field office has got this special line, this teleporter, this technology, I don't know what it is, but this tel- where there's communications directly with Yoel Roth, the key guy at, at Twitter. Um, Who's no longer there. And then you had the Department of Homeland Security say that they were going to set up the, uh, the, the Disinformation Governance Board, as if some federal agency should be the arbiter of what you and I are allowed to say uh, in, 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 a, in, in, in the public and on, and on some of these uh, platforms. Could that third one be a mistake, not a weaponization? Just a bad idea. I mean, I'm asking. On. Well, I mean, you can. That's you can, their defense. You can I'm say, just asking. It's a bad idea. They pushed it pretty darn hard. And Merrick Garland, by the way, has not rescinded the memo on the first one. So those are just a. No, no, a, I'm the a, third a, one. This disinformation thing with Homeland Security. They but the, uh, but the think I'm, about I'm the asking, idea that. <clears throat> well, go back and think about this. For I'm a not second. in favor of any every, government entity t- every, deciding what is or isn't. I'm just asking. Every single right we enjoy as Americans under the First Amendment over the last two years has been assaulted. Every one. You you're, said okay. You're, you're. I mean, your right to practice your faith. Right to assemble, right to petition the government, freedom of press, freedom of speech, everyone. Adam Schiff was contacting Twitter to say, take down the post of a journalist. That's something you guys should really care about. The, I remember when Jen Psaki stood at the White House and she said this, and in the White House— Former White House press secretary, yeah. In the White House, in the press room. Now think about it. The White House is considered the beacon of freedom on the planet. In the press room of the White House, she says these sentences. Most Americans now get their news from social media platforms. We, the White House, act, the Biden administration, actively working with social media platforms to limit certain information Americans can see. And I'm, I'm, I'm literally watching this in, in my office, and I'm like, are you kidding me? The press spokesperson for the mm-hmm. President of the United States is directly talking about limiting freedom of the press. And so on and on, your right to petition your government. Nancy Pelosi kept this Capitol closed for a year and a half so that the citizens who pay for this place can't even come in and lobby their member of Congress to redress their grievances. So this is what we're concerned about. And then you had this idea they were going to set up a disinformation governance board and say, what's misinformation, what's not? The very government that told us all kinds of things about COVID that turned out to be absolutely false. I think that's almost laughable if it wasn't so serious. Mm -hmm. What is the scope? Just the two years of the Biden administration? Has the government never been weaponized against the American citizens before that? Oh, it sure has. I mean, the very one of the very first big investigations that um, we got involved with when 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 I was early in my time here in, in Congress was the targeting of conservatives by the IRS. The whole Lois Lerner thing, where they systematically targeted conservative groups. So it's it's a it's a 
I think, a relatively recent concern. Although if you go clear back to the 70s in the Church Commission, they were very concerned about things the FBI was doing no back question. then. Back then it was actually more targeted to to uh, left-leaning groups, I think, in many ways. Do you, and, do you and, regard but it was just the as bad. select committee as something like the Church Committee? Um, we, we, we think we're going to have that kind of focus, yes, because we think it's that serious. The thing that troubles me most about it is the comments Mr. Nadler made on the House floor two days ago when he said this is, I mean, before it's even formed, he said this is political and we're going to fight it tooth and nail. And I said on the House floor, I said, why wouldn't you guys work with us? You used to care about the First Amendment. Will you be the chair of the Select Committee? That's up to, the, that's up to Speaker McCarthy. He has indicated you probably will. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Do you intend but- to be? Well, that again, that's it's his final call, and I don't ever talk about that until it's official and, and the people— we don't well, know who's will the ratio on the of the committee be? Looks like it's going to be 9 to 6, yeah. Why? It's the typical ratio of the Congress, I think, in the overall Judiciary Committee. It's going to be 20, 25 to 19, so it's a comparable. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. the sort of the ratios that happen. It's basically the ratios I think Nancy Pelosi would have had, had in, the, in the last As Congress. you well know, lots of people are curious about one of the— clauses in the organization resolution talking about uh, the committee's interest in ongoing criminal investigations. Yeah. It's not necessarily, an, it's not an interest in any specific ongoing criminal investigation per se. It's just the idea that every time you, we, almost every hearing we have with one of these federal agencies, we'll ask a question, well, I can't talk about that because it's an ongoing criminal investigation. Or more often than not, the answer we get is it's an ongoing personnel matter. And we're like, we're the Congress of the United States. Mm-hmm. We're the ones elected by the American people. We're, we're, we have a duty to get to the bottom of these things. And you agencies, which, oh, by the way, Congress created, Congress funds, you're not going to answer our questions? So that's that. we, we want to just put in there that we're going to be asking the questions that need to be answered for the American people. Are you familiar with the Linder letter? I'm not. Okay. Uh, you might acquaint yourself with it. Okay. Uh, it is a letter written to a member of Congress in 2000, John Linder, by the Bush administration's Justice Department. And it cites precedent, goes back to the early 20th century, flows through the Delano Rose- Franklin Delano Roosevelt's re- uh, administration. Uh, and it cites precedent in the Reagan administration. It essentially says Congress has all sorts of legitimate oversight, roles, and Mm-hmm. capabilities. But it cannot, and the Justice Department will not cooperate with questions about ongoing criminal investigations because that will harm the process by which those con- investigations are conducted and give the appearance that an ongoing criminal investigation might in some way or shape or form be influenced by politics if questions were answered as those investigations <laughs> are going on. Well, that last point is, is laughable, Major. That politics I'm may influence. <laughs> that politics may influence uh, uh, decisions by the Justice Department, that's all we've seen. I mean, again, go back to what we first talked about. Look at the difference in treatment of President Trump versus what now we see with, with former Secretary Clinton and, of course, now with, uh, with, with President Biden. Look at the difference between wh- how pro, uh, pro-abortion activists have been treated who, who, in direct violation of a statute— 18 U.S.C. 1507 are protesting in front of Supreme Court justices' homes with the intent, specific intent. They said st- they said it in all their postings. They said it specific intent to influence the decision on the on the on the Dobbs case. Direct violation statute. To my knowledge, nothing has happened to them. But again, I go to Mr. Hauk in Pennsylvania. I go to the to the grandmother, the the 90 year old grandmother in Tennessee who was arrested for praying in front of a uh, abortion clinic there. So. That, that politics is already there, for goodness sake. So that, that, that last sentence, make, maybe it made some sense in the Bush administration, but it sure doesn't make sense with this administration. And people who are lawyers, and I'm not one, though this, again, looks like a deposition, it's not, have said that that Linder letter and this history of precedent will give the Justice Department more than enough justification to ignore any questions this committee might well, pose about ongoing criminal investigations, essentially asserting that you will be stymied from the get-go. Well, we... Uh, <laughs> We know we're going to get pushback. We know this is not going to be easy. But um, one of the things I think is important is we have now had dozens of whistleblowers come talk to Republican staff on the Judiciary Committee over the last several months. And these are primarily FBI agents. Active duty. Many of them are, who come talk to us and say, look, this is what's – one of these. One of them said the FBI at the highest level, not the rank-and-file agents. They're They're – doing the Lord's work, but the, at the highest levels here in the Washington field office and here in D.C., said rotted at its core. 
that's a pretty and then the examples they give about what's going on. I mean, remember, it was it was the whistleblower we who first will, came to us about the education, about the, the school board's issue and the threat tag label. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan, we will pick up that line of conversation on the other side of this break. I'm Major Garrett coming to you from the library of the House Judiciary Committee. Back in a minute. Back in a minute. You now have a major political party that doesn't want to work with us on protecting the First Amendment. That's scary. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. Again, for those of you watching on Paramount Plus and CBS News Streaming, there are so very many of you, especially on CBS News Streaming, because this week we're coming to you at a different time, different day, Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern, new time slot. We're happy about that. We're in very good company. Face the nation in 60 minutes. You can't get in better company than that. <clears throat> Jim Jordan, House Judiciary Committee Chairman, is our guest. Mr. Chairman, um, you mentioned the whistleblowers. Those of us, you were involved. I watched every minute of it. The first impeachment of mm-hmm. former President Trump, a whistleblower was involved. There were calls for that whistleblower to be identified. Will you identify your whistleblowers? It's up to them. Uh, I think. In several- general, is that something you are an advocate of? I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate for following the statute. Uh, right now, we're concerned about uh, what looks to be retaliation against some of these individuals who've come forward and talked to uh, our staff. Those who want to go public, <clears throat> we will uh, we will look to do that. I think several of them do, uh, particularly the ones who've who've came to us with information and then subsequently were retaliated against. I think they want to tell their story, so um, we're, we're we're looking to do that, and we'll be working with them and seeing which ones, uh, in fact, may come forward. Do you think, in general, whistle whistleblowers should be believed and not be run through the political mill? Uh, I think there should be a chance to evaluate that, but uh, remember and. The whistleblower you cited, um, who was never made name was never made public, but that that whistleblower was what was involved there was the removing of the duly elected president of the United States. That's a that's pretty significant thing, um, and we do know that uh, Congressman uh, Schiff, who said he didn't speak with him, then subsequently had to change that story, was communicating with him and advising that that individual. So. Um, I think it's a little, little different scenario, but I'm, we're going to follow the statute. We're going we're gonna to do what the whistleblower statute requires. Mr. Chairman, you well remember last Congress there were efforts to uh, remove a member of the Republican conference from committees. There's talk of removing some Democrats from their committees. Adam Schiff is among them. Are you supportive of those efforts, or do you want to name those Democrats who well, should I think lose th- committee I think, positions? I think and Speaker, why? I think Spe- Speaker McCarthy has laid out uh, the the folks on the Intel Committee that he thinks should be on the Intel Committee. That's a decision. Adam Schiff. Yeah, that's a decision for the Speaker. He that's a direct appointment from through the Speaker's office on that uh, committee. Uh, not else? not runs to the steering committee. I think I think the speakers mentioned uh, Mr. Schiff and Mr. Swalwell. Mm-hmm. So um, if that's what the speaker wants to do, we're supportive. You're supportive. Yeah, I think the whole conference will be supportive of that. Why is it a good idea for members to be removed from committees over disputes of that nature? I, I typically haven't favored that, um, but this is this is a different committee, um, and I, I typically don't call for members to be removed. I don't call for members to resign. I think that's that I think that question is for uh, the member and his voters in his uh, in, in his or her respective district. That's between you and the people. Um, so uh, I, I, t- I typically don't do that. But this is, a, I think, a different situation in that the Speaker of the House names the folks because it's a select committee on intelligence, permanent select committee on mm-hmm. intelligence. So in select committees, that's a call for the speaker. The speaker's indicated he's going to do that. I think you'll see the Republican conference support that. Back to your select committee. Will it issue subpoenas? Yeah, I assume so. Yeah, we plan on it. You were issued subpoenas by the January 6th committee. You yep. did not comply. What if members, or do you, do you anticipate the need to, uh, to subpoena through the select committee any members of Congress? I don't know. Um, I think that's, a, I think that's a, got all kinds of constitutional problems. And I would just point out, I didn't, I, didn't, um, I never said I wouldn't testify. When they, sent, when they asked, first they asked and then they sent a subpoena, both times I responded with a letter. I never said I, never said I wouldn't, but I had all kinds of concerns. And I think any rational, common sense person would have concerns because we caught this committee in so many lies. They lied about Barry Loudermilk's reconnaissance tour. They lied about Jenna Ellis's uh, uh, schedule. They lied about Bernie Carrick's travels. They lied about Eric Hirschman's note. They lied about me twice. 
They sent a text message that I had forwarded to the White House chief of staff. Mm -hmm. They portrayed it as coming from me when it wasn't. It was then, from that, whom? It was from a lawyer here in town who was who would, who had laid out a kind of a brief and an argument um, that I passed on to the White House chief of staff. They took a video. This was this was the most. And since ridiculous. you raised that, why did you pass that along? But they asked me to pass it along, so I passed it along. Did I you thought, endorse it? Do you do you I agree with it? I did endorse. I just I just thought it was an argument that needed in the, in the time when we're debating all this was an argument that made some sense to take a look at. But the, but the, the one but that was just, most just, egregious. Just, just to be specific, that was on Jan, That was on or around January sixth, was it not? Yes. The, um, and it called for the vice president to ignore or remove electoral votes, correct? It laid out an argument that was made, I think, by one, I forget, was it Hamilton? Some would say I think that it was is, Hamilton that, or Madison. That makes the you guys supportive in, of a coup or adjacent to supporting well, a coup. Th those people would be crazy if they said that because it's just not true. But uh, the one that was most egregious is the January 6th committee played a video, played a video of me on doing a TV interview. I don't know if it was late December, early January, but in this in this in this time frame between election and 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 the, the, the new in the next president inauguration, some in that time frame, and I said that the clip they played is I I said January sixth is the ultimate date of significance in a presidential contest. The part they left out because it is it's the, it's the fourth step. There's the election, then there's a meeting of the of the electoral college, there's a certification by the states, State and then there's the final, and right. there's the final vote. So it is the final fourth and final step. Uh, what they left out of the, the, the clip is the first part where I said the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said January 6th is the ultimate date of significance in a presidential contest. That, that kind of changes the meaning. So when you got a, when you got a, this committee with no cross-examination ability on the committee, all people who voted to impeach President Trump, all people who were, were uh, uh, basically on the Democrat side, there's a reason I was concerned about testifying, but I never said no. Mm -hmm. And will those subpoenas be something that under the select committee jurisdiction, the majority will only be able to articulate? I mean, I know that's a process, but will you attempt to make these bipartisan subpoenas? <laughs> you think the Democrats are going to? I mean, Jerry Nadler has already said he's going to fight this tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have to get agreement with Jerry I'm Nadler asking, who we're going to subpoena. I'm just asking the orientation. I would love to get agreement with those guys. But I kind of doubt they're going to do it. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. based on what they said, even before the resolution passed. I mean, th th that to me is this, this, the truly frightening thing about the country today is you now have a major political party that doesn't want to work with us on protecting the First Amendment. That's scary. They, they, actually, they actually support a disinformation governance board. The Democrats do. They actually support paying, the, paying Twitter with taxpayer money through the FBI, paying Twitter and other – well, paying Twitter, we don't know about the others, to censor certain viewpoints. I mean, really? And these were the same people telling them to censor certain viewpoints when it came to COVID that we all know turned out to be the when very it, things they were trying to censor when it comes wasn't, to, wasn't actually accurate what they were trying to Mr. do. Mr. Chairman, when it comes to social media platforms, Section 230, what do you want to do about it? What do you think this Congress ought to do about it? Yeah, I think that, that legislation, we'll work on that as, as some as well in our committee, but that will be primarily out of... Uh, I think energy and commerce, but we've been working with. Uh, what are your thoughts Chairman. about that? What's the what's I the remedy? It, I think I think I think it, you get rid of it. I really do. Um, and that would change make things. How explain that? What does what, well, what would it, the world look like differently without it? I think it gives I give, think it gives the customer, the consumer, the ability to say if you're censoring, and I, and I know censoring is actually the government doing it, but but if they're Correct. if they're limiting certain viewpoints on there and and suppressing viewpoints or taking down certain viewpoints. Uh, if they're making editorial decisions, then there's then that they don't have the liability protection that they currently have. That's that's the, sort of the, the the basics around Section 230. Um, I actually think it it should be. This is now the public square mm -hmm. in so many ways. Even even like I would said you, earlier, would you argue that social media platforms have replaced, or if not replaced, moved into a larger place than the printing press was as we regarded it in the 19th and 20th century? And broadcast media. Well, I just, I think, I think it's become a a um, meaning a, more a, people no, receive understand. their I, information. It, it, I mean, even Jen Psaki said that from the White House press room. So it's obviously a medium now that that so many people use, that so many people get their information from. And if you're having the government put their thumb on the scale and say we're going to scale back and suppress certain things that the country can't see, I think that's a problem. And of course, the, the best example is what happened in the fall of 2020 when 51 former intel officials write a letter 
saying the Hunter Biden story has all the earmarks, earmarks. of the Russian, mis- uh, Russian information operation. When it wasn't, it was factual. And that became the basis to suppress that story and keep it from the American people just days before the most important election we have. That is the voice of Jim Jordan, the Judiciary Committee Chairman of the House of Representatives. I'm Major Garrett. Segment four of The Takeout coming your way from the library of said House Judiciary Committee in just one moment. You had like five million illegal migrants come into the country, and I do believe it's been done in an intentional fashion. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. Again, I keep saying this because it's true. It looks like a deposition. It's not. It's a conversation with the House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. You bet. Um, One of the areas of jurisdiction for the Judiciary Committee is immigration. Some Democrats have called for the revocation of the visa of Jair Bolsonaro, former president of Brazil. Favor or disfavor? I haven't thought about uh, that. that, um, I'll talk with our staff and some of our members and, and see... Um, so I haven't, haven't even, you know, taken, taken, a, taken a look at that situation. What we have taken a look at, what we are serious about and concerned about is the fact that we no longer have a border. I mean, it, 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 in, in, all, in any real sense, you had like five million illegal migrants come into the country. And I do believe it's been done in an intentional fashion. Um, contrary to what Mr. Mayorka says when he testifies or when he gives an interview, it's intentional, it's deliberate, it's premeditated. There's no other way to, to interpret this. In that and light, it's wrong. based on what you just said, uh, would the Judiciary Committee be the committee of jurisdiction for any proceedings to impeach yes, it would. Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas? Yes, it would. Are you in favor of that? Um, again, that'll be a decision we will decide as a committee and in conjunction with the Speaker in the conference. I think when you're doing something that, that big, you have to get full support of, of, the, of the conference if you're going to go there. But I would say this, he certainly warrants it. No one has done a, a, a no one has done, a, I don't know how you could not do a job worse than he has. Um, and it's. Um, would you expect that to be debated and possibly proffered this year? Uh, we'll see. But again, we're, we're going to decide that as a conference. We're not going to, the, the full committee, Republicans on the committee and the conference will look and see if we want to go down that route. we got a lot of work to do. Uh, we, we do want to pass an immigration enforcement bill out of the committee and out of the House. I think that's important to show the country, here's what we need to do to actually get control of our border. And it will be an enforcement-only bill, as I understand it. Well, there'll be, there'll be some things we would do that I think will help us with enforcement, like on asylum defini- uh, uh, definitions and on, um, and on uh, the whole catch and release thing that's going on right now. I mean, in essence, I, I always say that I, I try to say it in the simplest terms possible. What the Biden administration did when they came in on day one is they said, we're going to stop building the wall. We're going to get rid of Remain in Mexico. And when you come to the country, we're going to let you in and you're going to get to go wherever you want. No one's going to get deported. And so... You, 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 what we have now is when you, when that is the message, you can't fault people for wanting to come to the greatest country in the world. So they come here, they know there's no wall to get over. They won't have to wait in Mexico while their asylum claim is evaluated. They're going to get into the United States and they're going to, they're going to get to go wherever they want. No wonder we've had millions and millions of people come. So that's what's got to change. Even former President Trump would say, no, there's still plenty of wall. They just didn't complete it. Right. Right. They stopped. They would say that. Yeah. Even though he walked beside it this past week. You mentioned week a moment ago, but I just want to ask you specifically. You said you are not in the habit of saying that members of Congress of either party should resign. Four members of the Republican Party of this conference from New York have said George Santos should resign. Agree yeah. or disagree? I think that's between Mr. Santos and the folks in his district. I mean, they... Is there anything that you have read or heard about that give you concerns about his ability to serve in this Congress? Well, I mean, look, we've all read the... Uh, I haven't read much of it, but I've, all, I've heard about... Uh, what's been reported about things he has said, um, but again, I think, I think. Are you that's concerned a, about that in any way? I think we're always concerned if 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 there's um, people who say things that aren't accurate. I'm concerned when when President Biden says things that aren't accurate, which he seems to do every week. So um, I think we're always concerned about that. But in the end, I trust the American people. There and are other decisions between the Congress criminal nature about his conduct as well. Does that concern you? Oh, of, of course it would concern. I think it concerns anyone. Uh, but I, I leave this to the people of the 
Uh, I think it's part of Long Island, part of the city that, that Mr. Sanders Does it matter represents. to you that Nassau and Suffolk County Republicans have called on him to resign? Again, there's local people that he can, they can voice their opinion to their member of Congress, which is how this great system works. I have people talk to me all the time from our district, calling up our, uh, our office. That, that's how, that's how, and you're a representative. Of course you want to hear from folks back home. So we'll see how that Would all. Would you be comfortable with him on the Judiciary Committee? I don't know that he's interested in that, uh, if that's what the speaker wants. The speaker and the steering committee decide who's on what committee, but I don't think he's expressed an interest because it, it wasn't on the list of names of people who wanted to be on judiciary. Understood. Would Kevin McCarthy be speaker but for Jim Jordan? I think Kevin McCarthy has done a good job. I think he's going to do a good job as speaker. That wasn't he my would, question, He Mr. wouldn't Chairman. be speaker but for the fact that he got, he got 200 and— uh, uh, with the end of 216, you got a majority of the people voting on the on the on the day of the vote, um, and I think he's going to do a good. You job. were not neutral. No, I was for I was for uh, Speaker McCarthy. And you yeah. lobbied onto his behalf privately and publicly. I think he's done a good. I, look, I've been here for for a few Republican leaders. No Republican leader has reached out to conservatives like Leader McCarthy has. No Republican leader has embraced the oversight that the Constitution requires us to do, like Speaker McCarthy has. And I felt that. While that debate that happened last week was healthy, and I think we got some good rule changes from it, I felt all along that he would uh, he was the guy who deserved to be speaker. Uh, you know, I always use the sports analogy. The guy who gets you to the Super Bowl should get to coach the game. And um, he got us to the majority in, in a lot of his work in recruitment of candidates and helping us get the kind of people who need to get us uh, to win those elections to get to the majority. I think he deserves a right to be speaker. For the betterment of my audience, explain why there was an opposition to him in the first place and why it seemed to emanate from a part of the conference that you were very familiar with. And oh, yeah. Freedom been Caucus. Those are my buddies. They're good guys. Longstanding relationship with. Was yeah. it personal? What was it policy? Was it – it's often said, Mr. Chairman, that – Congress is not altogether that different from high school, yeah. personal grudges and grievances <laughs> and not being a part of the cool kids, whatever. What was it? What was the essence? You'd have to, you'd have to ask them. Come on, you uh, have my, a sense. My, my you guess, have a sense. You my, know what it was about. My guess is there's maybe some of that. What? Um, some of what you described as, as maybe some- High school grievances? Some, some per, no, I don't want to say some, <laughs> some personal. Uh, but, you know, that's life. We all got, we all got mm-hmm. folks like that. Uh, but in this business, what I've learned is- you, you don't hold a personal grudge against people because you're going to have to work with them and you're never going to get anything done. And the point I tried to stress with the entire conference for for the last year or so is whatever, I said this on the floor when I nominated Speaker uh, McCarthy, whatever differences exist in the Republican conference, I think the example I used was between Joyce and Jordan. Dave Joyce is a buddy of mine from Ohio and more, more, more moderate member. Uh, whatever those differences are, are pretty minor pretty darn minor compared to the differences between Republicans and the left, which now controls the Democrat Party and and where they want to take the country. So let's figure out a way to work together. And oh, by the way, we're going to have to because there's only 222 of us. We better figure that out. I think Leader McCarthy, now Speaker McCarthy, had had proven he could do that and will do that going forward. As you well know, Mr. Chairman, there are assumptions that that fractious prolonged four-day saga weakened him as a speaker. What do you believe? I think we'll come together because we have to. How else are you going to get something done? You know, there's only there's only 222 of us. We're, we're going to have like. And well, the, why, the, 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 the theory is, is that is among the easier votes to cast. Well, um, and it was also I, I think for uh, I think it was also viewed as a leverage point to get some of the rule changes that I think are going to help us uh, stop some. As I said on the on the floor when when I nominated uh, uh, Speaker McCarthy. Um, the, the, the rule changes, um, I think, are, are going to help us stop this $1.7 million, you know, trillion dollar bill, this monstrosity of a bill that, that passed, what, three weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, maybe today, um, that no one got to see. I mean, that's what that rules package is, mm-hmm. and they use that, that, that moment as a way to help us get rules in place, which hopefully will help us stop things At like that. At the margin, stronger. I think so, yeah. That is the voice of... House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan. For our radio audience, we need to say farewell for those streaming on CBS News Streaming, watching on Paramount Plus, and our beloved podcast platform followers, the Takeout Outtake Especial comes next. See you next week. He got more done than any president I've ever seen, and he did it with every Democrat in the town against him, everyone in the mainstream press against him, half the Republicans against him. CBS News. This is The Takeout with Major Garrett. 
Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. I am, of course, M. Major Garrett. Still am. Always will be. <laughs> Jim Jordan, House Committee, House Judiciary Committee Chairman, is our guest. Lightning round, Mr. Chairman, okay. if you please. Okay. I'm going to list off a number of states yeah. that conducted midterm elections in 2022. I want to ask you a simple question. Do you accept the results certified in Georgia? Yeah. Wisconsin? Yeah. Michigan? Yes. Pennsylvania? Yes. Nevada? <laughs> yeah. Arizona? Yes. Do you accept the results of the 2020 presidential election? Yes, I've been clear about I've been clear about that uh since since Joe Biden It was Biden not was, stolen. Since Joe Biden from President but Trump. But here's what here's here's the key. Here's the key and this is this is something that uh I think it would be a benefit to the entire country. There were all kinds of people who have concerns about what happened in 2020 uh, in several states. And there were all kinds of changes made to election law in many of those, those states that people have concerns about, the ones you just listed, mm -hmm. that were done in a fashion that was not consistent with the Constitution. So I argued from the get-go. I never said it was stolen, rigged. All I said is there are problems that we should investigate. And oh, by the way, it wasn't just Republicans who had concerns. It's also Democrats. So for the good of the country— we should have investigated, and that's what I was calling for. And the reason I objected to certain states is because they changed their election law. Pennsylvania is the best example. They changed it in an unconstitutional fashion. Understand. What would you des describe the influence in the Republican conference in the House and Republican Party broadly of former President Trump? Huge. He's the party leader, and I think he was a great president. Um, is he the likely nominee had? for the party in 2024? I sure hope so. I'm for him. I do, because he came to this town and he did what he said, and that is, the, that is the biggest problem. The biggest problem is Republicans get elected back home, come to this town, and figure out ways to not do what they said. He came here and did what he said. He said he'd build the wall, he did. Said he cut taxes, he did. Said he reduced regulation, he did. Said he put conservatives on the court, he did. Said he put the embassy in Jerusalem, he did. On and on. You tell me another president who's, who's specifically laid those things out and coming. Early in, the, in his administration, I'm in the, I'm, I remember in the, white, uh, in the West Wing, I can't remember which office. It might have been Jared's office, someone's office. I'm in there. And they have a big whiteboard, and they listed every promise they made to the American people, every single one. And they were just checking them off as they were getting them done. That's how you're supposed to do the job. And what we have all too often is Republicans get this town, and they, oh, I can't do what I told them. i got to make excuses for what they're supposed to do, what they told the voters they were going to do. President Trump didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And for those who write or suggest that his authority or clout within the Republican Party is diminished after the midterm elections, you would say what? No, I, I disagree. And and he's announced he's running for president, so there's going to be a primary, and I think he's going to win. Evaluate Ron DeSantis for me. Great guy. Great guy. You know him. When we formed the Freedom Caucus, there were nine of us that started it. Ron was one of the original nine. He's done an amazing job as governor. Would you expect him to run against former President Trump? It's up to him, but I'm for President Trump, whether he runs or not. Okay. Would you say that of everyone else who's likely to run? Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence. Mike Pompeo's a great guy. Mike Pence. Nikki is, Haley. All great, all great guys. Um, or Nikki Haley, great lady. Uh, but uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, he and I worked together. We were on the Benghazi Committee together. We wrote a separate separate report uh, at, at the end. Uh, Mike was an outstanding, I mean, ran the CIA, of course, ran the State Department. Just a great guy. I have the utmost respect for him. Uh, Vice President Pence. When I first got here, was one of the guys that all us newer guys looked up to as a conservative that you, you took advice. So all good guys, but I'm for Trump. Would former President Trump benefit by a active contested primary? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I assume there's going to be one. Um, well, maybe not, you know, because I, I think he's I think he's the I think he's the strong favorite. And maybe many of these many of these individuals are going to say, I don't want to run. But whether they run or not, I think he's going to win. Mm -hmm. And do you think he will win the presidency in 2024? I do. I do. I really do. I mean, all you got to look at is the American people, what's happened to them in the last record inflation, record debt, border that's not a border, crime uh, at record levels. Uh, I think they, they, they realize what, what they miss. What and they would you expect, a, if it were to occur, a second Trump presidency to be run differently than the first? I think he'll do what he said. I think he'll get in there and do what he said and, and get America back on the right uh, track and put America's interests, American interests first, uh, which is— uh, you know, why he ran in the first place. You know what I'm driving at with that question. That is, 
hiring people who he is sure from the get-go are more loyal to oh, of him course. than those he brought well, in the first time. Well, I don't know if it's—I mean, loyalty is an important quality in, in life, period. I don't know if it's, it's a, if it's just a question of loyalty, though, just <clears throat> the right people for the right job. I mean, you, you, you do want the right person in, in, the, in the State Department. You do want the right person in the, but you know the what I mean. attorney general. And, and There were those over time, whether this is correct or not, the former president came to regard were working against him, even though he hired them in the first the place. The whole bureaucracy was working against him. That, but he even appointed people. He well, came to doubt. In some cases, yes. But like the, this, whole, so th- this is what is amazing about the guy. He got more done than any president I've ever seen, and he did it with every Democrat in the town against him, everyone in the mainstream press against him half the Republicans against him, and all the bureaucracy. And the, fa- and, the, and the fourth point may have been the most important, all the, quote, you know, call it deep state swamp, whatever you want to call it. But all those people working against you, th- that's tough. And in spite of that, got so many things done for the American people. Um, that's why I appreciate him so much. We need that kind of attitude, that kind of toughness, and frankly, that kind of strength projected from the Oval Office to our enemies and adversaries around the world. That is the voice of House Judiciary Com- Committee Chairman Jim Jordan. Mr. Chairman, it's been a pleasure. Good to be with you. Thank you. That concludes your Takeout Outtake Especial. I'm Major Garrett. We'll see you next week.